Hey there. So, in light of recent events, I've decided to become insane. It's been confirmed that men really do hate women as much as we feared, so yeah, I've decided to lose the remainder of my marbles. I'm already the Antichrist. Imagine how much more evil I can become. Won't you join me on this journey? Watch me simultaneously talk about horror and spiral into madness with the click of a button. The subscribe button. Actually, a few more buttons, the like button and the notification bell, that way you never miss the next video. And under every video for the last few years, years now, I've linked a pro-choice resource page. You're not alone, ladies. We are resilient motherfuckers. We're gonna be okay. But let's escape for a while, shall we? Let's talk about a very exciting new horror release, Heretic. Usually, roughly the first half of my reviews are spoiler-free, and then I do sort of a mini plot breakdown. Don't worry, you will get a warning when that time comes. So excited that our escapist topic today involves so much discussion about religion. Let's get started. First of all, I want to get into casting, because this is such an unlikely thing for Hugh Grant to do. We've definitely known for a little while that he is very much a character actor that I, I guess because he was so handsome back in the day, they were like, nah, you're a leading man. He's come a long way from his rom-com days. I didn't really know that about him for the longest time until I saw the new Wonka film last year when he played the little Oompa Loompa and you just could tell that no part of him was phoning it in. He really had that weird little man energy to him. And I was like, okay, Hugh Grant, to be really honest, I was not familiar with your game. And then he steps it up to 11 in this movie, and I, it wasn't anything, like, unexpected. Just given the recent trajectory of his career, I was like, I know that you're gonna deliver. Another person that I knew was gonna deliver absolutely is Sophie Thatcher. She is very quickly becoming one of my favorite girlies in horror. I feel like she's been on a similar path as, like, Anya Taylor-Joy. I don't know if she's just really picky with her projects, but she seems to exclusively choose films that showcase her best abilities. I really didn't like Boogeyman, but she was an obvious standout and made that movie watch. I thought she was a little bit of an odd choice in this movie because, th look, this is, I'm, okay, let me try to be delicate here. She's a beautiful girl. She does look like she's had a good amount of work done on her face. Maybe not, like really honestly, maybe not, because if you scroll back several years, she's always had very prominent cheekbones and stuff. But when I look at this gorgeous, gorgeous woman, I do not think, yeah, Mormon. <laughs> so her look was throwing me off a little bit, but then as layers of her character are uncovered, I was like, okay, maybe that kind of was an intentional choice. Because if you didn't know what this movie is about, it's about these two girls that are, whatever they call them, they're like, I want to call them door-to-door -door salesmen because like that's what they are. But they are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Blech. Sorry, I'm the Antichrist. What did you expect that I was going to be like, oh yes, love the Mormons. It's about these two girls and they stumble upon the wrong house. Let me tell you, Hugh Grant's character has got another thing coming for them. Anyway, Sophie Thatcher, I think probably has had the strongest performance in the movie, but it's hard to say because even though this movie was two hours long and so much of it was entirely dialogue driven, I did not feel that at all. This movie really does hinge on the performances of these three people because when you really break it down, not that much happens. Exciting things are uncovered. There are big moments. Sure, it's not that much going on in this movie. A lot of it is people having conversation. That being said, let me talk about our third and final lead, Miss Chloe East. I guess I saw her in The Fablemans, but I don't don't remember her in that movie, so I can confidently say I was not familiar with her game. She is the most unlikely force of this movie. In the beginning, she feels very typecast, and honestly, for me, not very likable. I know those poor people are brainwashed, but I can't listen to them chatter about Jesus Christ. I can't do it. Which, by the way, ugh. I already get a fair amount of people in my comments that are like, Jesus is your savior, find God. They're probably gonna get worse under this video. Fun, fun for me. Maybe I should draw them out out so that I can just like block a good chunk of them in one fell swoop. God is dead and I eat unborn fetuses. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> now I'm really starting to understand why I always get compared to Aubrey Plaza. And you know what? That's a badge of honor for me. Anyways, Chloe East, beautiful, beautiful, gorgeous, so good in this movie. Taking it back to some of the dialogue, I think with that is where people got a lot of comparisons to Saw. I was seeing a lot of that on Letterboxd as well as comparisons to Barbarian, but we can't get into that until later. And I can 100% see what people are saying because there were traps in the form of religious philosophical questions. And I... I... <sniffs> 
ate that shit up. Ate it up like those unborn babies. No, no, stop. You know what? You're getting exactly what you subscribed for. I told you, the rest of my marbles, the few that I had left, gone. And I think that's why I love this movie so much because it was so thought provoking. And just to give a little history here so that any newcomers know that um, I'm not like a raging atheist baby eater. I should stop saying baby eater. I'm gonna get demonetized. I grew up going to a Presbyterian church. So it was like very lax in the religious department, except for like once a year when they would show us, what's the, what's the movie that like depicts the literal murder of Jesus Christ? The pa Passion of the, of the Christ or something like of that nature. They were showing us to that when we were like seven years old. That was, that was traumatizing. That's how they get you. You know, it's all chill. It's all fine and dandy. It's all about, oh, community and family coming together. And then it's bam, this man with chiseled abs, they killed him and then and they, he did it for you. And if you don't respect that, you're gonna burn for eternity. Okay, insane. Y'all act like I'm the crazy one. And like, it was chill. I didn't have anything against it until I had a friend who like discovered she was gay later in life. And then when she was in college, she tried to like come back into town and like still be really involved with the church. Um, And then they told her she was no longer welcome. So now I don't even rock with the Presbyterians. Y'all seemed chill. Duped, duped I was. But yeah, so for a good chunk of my life, and then even through, I don't know, like ninth grade or something, I liked to go to youth group just because it was something social to do during the week. I liked to be really active, really involved. I was always on like team sports and stuff. But then you get to a point where your critical thinking skills develop enough, uh, hopefully, so, I don't know about some of y'all, but you get to that point and then it's like, okay, this isn't worth it. Like, why am I really here? And my problem is never with belief. One of my very best friends from college also is like a pretty devout Christian. And we talk about that. Like we talk about all of her beliefs and all of my beliefs and whatever. Like, I'm, I don't know, I'm, sp I'm spiritual. I mean, I practice witchcraft, but honestly, mostly it's because I like the smell of the herbs. I'm not really a cynic. I just think that like, whatever the answer actually is, it's nothing that our human minds could ever possibly comprehend. So like, I'm not gonna try. I'm just gonna live my life. And if you need the threat of eternal damnation to be a good person, you are not a good person, okay? So that's my background and the thoughts and opinions that I was bringing into this viewing experience. And is this movie always successful in all of the ideas that it brings up. I don't think so because if it's not clear, I feel like it, this is not a spoiler. It's obvious that it, like thematically it's all about religion. So they bring in a lot of ideas, a lot of unlikely topics that you kind of even wouldn't expect. But you know, at one point there's discussion about even conspiracy theories because some people are religious in the way that they follow those. And some of those topics felt a little bit shoehorned. Like they kind of just dropped them in and then like we didn't really circle back. Wait, we were just talking about the simulation theory and now we're jumping right back into Mormonism. Okay. Oh, we're never going to return back to that? Okay, yeah, no, cool, cool, cool. So was all of that successful? No. Are you personally guaranteed to kind of feel the weight of all of the discussion of this movie? Honestly, no. Because for a lot of people, it's not going to work. I think that's fair. For me, whether or not something works, I'm at a point in my movie viewing journey where it doesn't matter to me so much whether the themes are successful, but whether they are thought provoking. And to me, this entire movie was. It's kind of like Rob Zombie's Halloween 2. The director's cut is a lot better, but even even the director's cut has a really messy ending and things like definitely do not come together. But I still love that movie. I re I do. I love Rob Zombie's Halloween too. The director's cut, like be clear, okay? But just because of the way that it like relentlessly tackles its subject matter, it does not shy away. Lori is a very difficult character to follow. She is tough to watch, but it's because the girl is going through it. And with Heretic, it's something that I feel like I'm gonna keep watching in my head for maybe the next few weeks because I'm constantly gonna be having this kind of inner discussion with myself about a lot of the stuff that was brought up in the movie. It's made me want to research various things more. I felt myself getting really swept up in Hugh Grant's character and like his obsessions because I was like, valid points are being made all around here. But the bottom line is this movie kept my gears turning and that's why I give it so much credit. If you haven't seen, if you don't follow me on Letterboxd, you should, but I gave it four and a half stars. I thought that it was nearly perfect up until the very ending. I thought, wow, this whole time they've kept this one location so incredibly dynamic. Even though it's a long runtime, I'm not feeling it because just their dialogue alone is keeping me so engaged. But the very ending falters just a little bit. And we will get there when the time comes. But that was the only reason why I couldn't give it a perfect rating. I was so bummed because I was like, oh man, just 
just didn't, I mean, they kind of stuck the landing. There were a lot of callbacks. There are so many things that are set up and none of those stones are left unturned. We come back to all of it and like everything is wrapped up quite nicely. In that respect, I'm not saying plot wise, spoiler wise, don't worry, but the very ending just didn't, it didn't quite hit. Felt like they didn't quite know where to go. They wanted to introduce all of these ideas and they had one that was like very resounding and it was kind of like, you know, the big climactic idea, if you will. I was with that. I, I was. But then beyond that, it felt like, okay, nobody knows where we go from there. Hopefully you don't feel like this has been too spoilery. I, I do my best. But with this movie, you know you're going into a horror movie and even though there is the dramatic irony of the fact that you know that something is going to go wrong, just given the nature of the genre, like you know, it does not deter interest at all. I felt very much kept on my toes wondering, well, how is this going to go wrong? And also Hugh Grant is very convincing as a charming fellow in the first act. To close off the spoiler-free section, I just wanna give you my final recommendation. Obviously I do recommend you get out and you go and see this in theaters. It seems like people already are. I had no idea how popular this movie was going to be, but it made like $3.8 million on preview night. I'm very excited to see what it does over the weekend. October may be over, but horror never is, baby. Bring your friends, bring your loved ones, bring a Mormon in your life. I wonder if this movie's gonna make religious people angry or not. Oh, that's a curious thing. This movie comes at you from so many different angles that I feel like whoever you are, you're gonna project whatever it means to you. And some people, I did say, complain about the movie being cowardly for that reason, because they didn't stick to a very definitive like pro or anti religion. But it's like, man, I think it depends Depends. You know, the world we live in is very morally gray and religion being one of the most ambiguous things of all. So I think that we can really like relax about that. But yeah, let me know. I'm so curious what my audience thinks of this film. Let me know in the comments down below, but I'm getting ahead of myself. I should ask you to do that when I finish talking about spoilers, which is starting right now. So if you haven't seen the movie, please do go see it and I will be waiting right here when you get back. Let's get into this juicy, juicy movie, okay? I'm gonna kind of just hit on all the most important plot points. Maybe I'll hit on some moments that stand out, like scares or whatever. I'll try to hit on all the major ideas of the movie as well, but you know, if I miss anything, then just feel free to comment and ask me about it below. So the movie kicks off, we are introduced to Sister Paxton and Sister Barnes. Immediately Barnes, she doesn't really fit the mold. Like I said, you know, she kind of has filler face. So I was like, this is an odd choice. And also like her mannerisms, the way that she addresses Sister Paxton when they're talking about pornography. It's clear that she's a little bit more of a learned person in this world and that Paxton Paxton is a lot more kind of innocent and naive. I like the way that they set up those characters, but I'll be so honest, I was pretty annoyed with Sister Paxton. My heart goes out to people in these situations that are that brainwashed, but it doesn't mean that I enjoy listening to them speak, okay? She's talking about how in this porno she was watching, somebody yelled at them through the wall, like, I can hear everything. And she's like, you just could see this girl's soul leave her body and, and realize shame. And I was like, shut shut the fuck up. <laughs> anyway, then we're introduced to Mr. Reed. They stop by his house. Lovely man. Oh, his wife is making a pie. You know his wife is not making a pie. You know that immediately. These girls are pretty firm about the rules that they follow. And oh, a woman has to be present in the room with us. It's for our safety, whatever. They still go into the house. Like they still, like they go into the house. Like they still go into the house. They still go into the house. They just take him at his word. Therein begins the lesson that uh, people with critical thinking skills and skepticism them, they're more likely to survive these scenarios. And getting a little ahead of myself, but during the first act turn, that is one of the first things that he brings up when he's starting to really dig in and like question their religion. Like you really, you just believe things because people tell you, couldn't be me. You're not catching me going into any old man's house, what? And he's starting with these pretty lightweight questions about Mormonism and their beliefs. And this is why I just was so immediately hooked. He's asking them questions like, do you think that polyamory is ethical? And then Sister Barnes spews some stuff about like, well, it was necessary for the church at the time and blah, blah, blah. And uh, no, they only stopped doing that because it just wasn't necessary anymore. They just needed to like make a lot more Mormon babies at the time. Which girl, is not is that not weird? That's not ringing alarm bells to you? It's giving eugenics, like whatever. And then he lays out explicit facts. He lays out the actual history of the founder of the Church of Latter-day Jesus Christ's butt crack, whatever. I'm trying to stop saying whatever so much, sorry. And all those types have 
have an off button when you ask the right question, right? So at that point, I mean, rightfully so, they're getting emotional because, yeah, I mean, their beliefs are being questioned in a very, like, upfront, direct way, and also because they're in danger, so fair enough. But with religion or people that support a certain fascist, there is always an off button when you when you get to a certain point of, of questioning what they stand for. What did throw me for a loop a little bit was that the smell of blueberry pie was from a candle because I just thought that he was cooking a pie. I didn't fully appreciate that reveal until he started to talk about, oh, you just believe everything you're told. And then I was like, you know what? Solid move. Then I was really on board with his whole lecture about how each religion is just an iteration of something that came before it. He compares it to Monopoly, which genius because yeah, it's all a form of capital. Why don't churches pay taxes? Let's think. But then he explores something that I never knew about where he lights up this wall of I think like 12 different figures and they're all figures from thousands of years of different religions that all have some sort of saint born on the 25th of December. It's just a bunch of stories that basically Christians ripped off to create the character of Jesus Christ. And honestly, I was here for that. When Sister Barnes retorts back like, well, you make all these comparisons of similarities while ignoring all the differences. And it's like, girl, I don't know. I mean, like those similarities are glaring enough on their own. I like, I think a point is being made because she's like, they're so different. That one has a bird head. Okay, well, Jesus Christ died and then apparently woke back up three days later and pushed a giant boulder out of the way of his cave and hobbled back to the village. So like, yeah, neither are really that realistic, but I was still really into her character. I was like, you know what? I forgive you because you're not scared enough to like really snap out of this yet. And oh, I was eating this up. But when it, when it became a study of the girls and he wrote belief and disbelief on the doors, I already knew immediately that they were gonna lead to the same place because I thought that he was then going to take kind of a nihilistic approach of like, it doesn't matter. We all end up just being worm food at the end of it all. So like, it doesn't matter. It's gonna lead to the same place. I should have, but I, for some reason was not expecting the whole descent into like the, what is it? The, the nine layers of hell? Is it seven? Ugh, I'm Satan's favorite daughter. I should know that. The whole prophet plot line was a strange one. And that was when I was like, oh yes, welcome back barbarian. In a good way. It was very different to barbarian. I, I thought that it definitely diverged from the inspiration material quite a bit with that. I didn't see it coming that the bodies had been switched though when she came back to life. I just thought that maybe she had, uh, what, what, what did they use in the Sherlock Holmes movie with Robert Downey Jr.? He uses poison from like a sea urchin or something or a puffer fish to stop his heart. The bad guy does. And then that's how he's able to be declared dead by the doctor or something. Anyways, I thought it was going to be one of those kind of twists. Cause I was like, yeah, definitely a magic trick. You know, nothing crazy going on. But then where the movie lost me for about two seconds here. I thought the writing was so phenomenal when he's like, oh, we're talking about magic tricks now. And she's like, no callback. We're talking about magic under. <gasps> thought that was a great moment. Thought it was really shocking because they take the character that's really strong. The one that you imagine is going to get them out of it. And then they do a roll reverse. And you're like, oh good God, how is Sister Paxton possibly, quite literally, how would she ever get herself out of this? She's the most naive and soft-spoken and like makes a, those around her comfortable type person. But I love that. They flipped the script, was very unexpected. But but lo it lost me for about two seconds here when he pulls the birth control out of her arm and he goes, ah, yes, th this is why she won't be able to come back to life because we are in a simulation and uh, this is a, th a wh whatever he called it, this is gonna, this is gonna block her from waking up, claiming that she's an artificial person because, because of the implant. Paxton realizing that it was a contraceptive though, I don't understand how that led to her understanding the whole gambit that he pulled by switching the bodies and stuff. I guess that's on me because sometimes quiet wallflower types, they are the most observant. So that is on me. I just, I didn't see it coming for her because I didn't figure that out. I had my own theories, but she figured that out quick. And I was like, ooh, plot twist. She's a lot smarter than I thought. Okay okay, this is gonna be good. Would I have figured that out? No, absolutely not. Because if this prophet delivered this weird ass message and then said it's not real at the end, I definitely don't think I would have deduced literally anything from that. I just would have been like, whoa, this bitch is talking crazy. But then that kind of made the simulation moment make a little bit more sense. I just wish that it hadn't been 
stopped in its tracks so suddenly because for one thing I'm like how did you figure that out and for another I don't believe that we come back to it and it's a really interesting concept I think that like conspiracy theories and their parallels to religion are fascinating but then as we descend into the final level and we discover what the one true religion is of control I was eating that up again I don't know how she figured that out so quickly and was then able to just like spoon feed us everything maybe I'm not like the craziest about how it all unfolded because I'm like wow how is she this smart but that the desire to control others is at the root of all religions I was like yes yeah, because you know what? It goes back to the story of my close friend that I grew up with at the Presbyterian church. We're fed this lie that it's like all about the community there and it's all about, oh, Christ bringing us together and we sing these songs. When it really came down to it, when she was like out and proud and she tried to come back and be involved, hard no, you don't fit the mold. Absolutely not. Like genuinely expecting her to like swear off dating women and be like, oh, I was sinning. I was mistaken. I'm sorry, father give me the penis, I've sinned. Is it spoon fed? Yeah, but it hit pretty close to home. So I was like, yes. But after that is where things really do lose me. Stabs him in the neck, great, love that for you. But then when she's kind of hanging around, I'm like, girl, you gotta do a little bit more work here to try to escape this fun house. But then she goes back down. I don't know if she's looking for another way out, I guess. And you've been through all of this and you don't hear the footsteps behind you. you you're, you've disappointed me, Paxton. She gets stabbed in the gut and then starts praying for the both of them. I don't, I don't know. Something about that wasn't clicking. Especially then when Sister Barnes resurrects and it's like, oh, she resurrected after all. There was a miracle after all. No, I think that she just used the, the last of what was inside of her to do that, to save Sister Paxton. And then that was it, died immediately. Cause like, yeah, if you've bled out that much, you don't have a lot of energy. She was probably tired. Then she gets out, yes, yay. And butterfly lands on her finger, ultimate callback, nice. But but that was a little bit too much. That was a little bit too much for me. I was like, okay, we spent this entire movie dismantling everything, but then they want to end off on the note that like miracles can still happen. It's nice. It's nice. I mean, it's nice. A nice coincidence that means that Sister Paxton will not completely lose her faith. Okay, cute. It was just a little bit too sappy for me. I think that's my problem because I don't know, even for me, the ending of it being, oh, like she's not going to fully lose her faith. Like miracles still can happen. I think that's nice, but I guess just the framing of it, I was like, okay, this is a little bit too cheesy after everything we just been through. So yeah, I think that was the problem. But also when the butterfly disappears, uh, I'm like, okay, so she, so she's just lost it. She's really traumatized and she's hallucinating now. It was very vague. Like, I just don't know what they were trying to do with the ending there. And I'm sure that that was the point and leave the people talking. Having an impactful ending to your horror film, I think is usually what helps it uh, stand the test of time, but I didn't like it. I didn't like it. I don't know. Maybe I'll change my mind upon a second viewing. I'm not sure. I'm curious what you thought of it. And again, I ask if you've seen this movie, what are your thoughts? We can get really juicy with it down below, but it did just come out. So maybe put a spoiler warning if you want to talk spoilers. I've got lots of other dedicated reviews on this channel, as well as I always do monthly recaps if there's something I've missed. I do deep dives as well. I do ranking videos. There's fun for the whole family. When I'm talking about um, eating food, no, we're, we're just, we're done talking about that. We're done talking about that. I also have a second channel where I talk about physical media all the time. I also post travel content and I have a Patreon. You get bonus reviews over there. You get podcast episodes with my dad and we talk about all the movies that we see together. I also post lots of juicy updates to my career. I share audition tape bloopers, things like that. I'm also on all the socials. So follow me wherever your heart desires. But more than anything, I just hope that you enjoyed this review today and I hope I got you in the next one. Bye.